1988. This was a pivotal year in gaming, both for me and the industry. If console gaming stood on a precipice overlooking greatness after the crash, this was the year it took the plunge and changed forever. Having grown up with an Atari 2600 for most of the 80s, I first experienced a Nintendo Entertainment System at a friend's house just down the street. Playing Super Mario Bros. blew my mind, and then I got to play The Legend of Zelda, and I knew I had to own a NES. The gulf that separated the feeling of Atari games from Nintendo games at the time seemed immeasurable. This console was from another planet. So what other games are there? My friend handed me Nintendo Power, the first and only issue at the time. The free sample copy blurb was later changed to free poster inside, along with a page number correction for the Mario 2 feature and the July-August 1988 label. The staff list in the table of contents shows cover design by Julie Backman, cover art by Joan Gratz. Joan Gratz is a very talented artist and animator. She won an Oscar for the short film Mona Lisa Descending a Staircase. You can see the mock-up of Mario and Wart in the opening fold of the first issue of Nintendo Power, and more prominently in the final issue of the Nintendo Fun Club newsletter. Joan was commissioned to build this scene out of clay, and it was then photographed for the final cover. Clay, more specifically Claymation, was popular at the time thanks to the California Raisins commercials and a Claymation Christmas celebration had just aired the previous Christmas. Super Mario Bros. 2 Unlike the glut of video game trivia you find on the internet today, most people back then didn't know that the American release of Super Mario Bros. 2 was a modification of an unrelated game from Japan called Doki Doki Panic. I think it was a really great follow-up to the original Super Mario Bros. from three years prior, and it made sense to use the sequel for a cover of the first issue. Nintendo Power appears to use adapted text from the game's manual for the premise, characters, moves, items, and enemies. <laughs> Despite describing the character traits at the start of the feature, they are depicted here with a two-page illustration. I really dig this and think it would make a great poster. Ah, now we're talking. Maps, hints, and item locations. Useful for those that already own the game, but also an extended print advertisement for those that don't. I don't think Super Mario Bros. 2 was available at retail until a few months after this issue, so now Nintendo had you pining for it within the first few pages of the magazine. I remember seeing game features in Nintendo Power for games that I didn't own, and I would pour over their pages and imagine playing the game. Save up and buy it, wait for birthday or Christmas, hope a friend gets it, or go out and rent it. It looks like perhaps there was some back and forth about the colors for Mario's clothing. I don't really remember Mario having a gun. I had at least one bad dream where Fanto chased me back when I was a kid. Anyone else have that dream? The Legend of Zelda, what a great game. You know, a decent chunk of my enjoyment of games back then actually came from printed artwork, from the manuals, boxes, and of course Nintendo Power. Your imagination was a large part of the experience, and the art helped enhance that experience, or at least it did for me. If I found art in Nintendo Power that I really liked, I would take out some paper and draw what I saw. This portrait of Link would be a great break from homework. The second quest of Zelda was an added bonus to a game that was great enough to not need it. Each dungeon map was a letter that spelled the name Zelda. You could also register your name as Zelda on the character creation screen to bypass the original quest and start the second one immediately. You know, one friend actually told me there was a fifth quest. Yeah, just beat it four times, and then the fifth quest begins. Stuff you make up and tell your friends at recess. And I'm pretty sure I bought into that one. Here's a fold-out map for the second quest. Very useful for navigating Hyrule or as wall decor. On the flip side, a baseball poster featuring three baseball games for the system. Easy to overlook if you aren't a baseball fan, or if you are, but you prefer the Zelda side of the poster. Closer inspection is quite fun though. We've got a Batman symbol in the sky and a batter swinging a Twizzler. Or is that a red vine? I had several baseball games for the Atari 2600 and also spent some time playing Earl Weaver baseball on the IBM PC. I didn't really get a NES baseball game until Roger Clemens MVP baseball. I do recall a day when Little League practice got rained out and we went to the coach's kid's house and played some RBI baseball. I have a bit of nostalgia for this one, despite only really playing it a couple of times. 
With new systems come new renditions of sports in video game form. It was a good idea for Nintendo to put together a feature on multiple games. Counselor's Corner. Let's examine some of these. Ghosts and Goblins. How do I beat the Red Devil? Fitting that the first game mentioned has a question asked by gamers young and old for years. The strategy here is to basically despawn him. Here's a simple question about Ring King. Metroid. I really love the original Metroid. I remember talking to a friend on the phone while he was playing. He had just rented it from the grocery store, which was a thing back then. And he said he was fighting Cheerios. I'd never seen the game before, but that made me want to play it. Turns out he was fighting Rinkas as he was approaching Mother Brain. Metroid is obviously a game where you can get lost and have trouble finding power-ups, so this is a huge help if you don't know your way around yet and have patience for navigating the small images. Yep, Marumari. Kind of missed that name for the Morph Ball. That unlimited 1-up trick in Super Mario Bros. is right here in the first issue. I remember trying to set that up back in the day a couple of times, but I don't think I pulled it off. For those curious about the fireworks at the end of the stage, it is also explained here, along with basically how to maximize your score. I was always under the impression that Kid Icarus had a decent sized number of fans back in the day, but I don't know anyone that owned it. I suppose it was because I saw it in Nintendo Power a lot, and eventually on Captain N the Game Master. Here's what to do with the Pegasus Flute in Rygar. How to defeat the bosses in Castlevania. They provide some suggestions for them here. You see the one for Dracula? If your friend made it to Dracula, you would yell, Cool his jets, man! If you played Akari Warriors, you probably needed ABBA to continue, and you probably needed it a lot. Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. How do you beat Tyson? The thing I remember most about fighting Mike Tyson for the first time is... We passed the controller around, trying this quite a bit back in the day. I think beating Mike Tyson is a prime example of a challenge that required you to lean heavily upon your friends and Nintendo power. I know it is difficult to believe with the ability today to freely watch a speedrunner like Sinister One beat the game blindfolded. Howard and Nestor, a comic based on the likeness of Howard Phillips and the fictional Nestor, a name based on the abbreviation for Nintendo Entertainment System. I was more of a fan of Howard and his bow tie than I was Nestor and his attitude. Ah, classified information, another favorite section of Nintendo Power. Pulling the goalies and also get a super speed puck in ice hockey. Blades of Steel would be released later that year, I think. Rad Racer and the ability to jump to various races in the game. One girl I knew back then owned Rad Racer, so I got to play it at her house. It was pretty fun and had a 3D mode that used those red-blue anaglyph glasses. Athena. Nobody really talks about this one much. The Contra Code. There are t-shirts and all kinds of gaming culture built around this code nowadays. This really helped you quite a bit, but it usually didn't take long before you wouldn't need the code. I feel it is more important when you want to team up with someone in co-op Contra while also preserving that friendship. Gunsmoke. Upgrade to the machine gun. Gunsmoke in the arcade used three buttons. Shoot left, shoot in the middle, and shoot to the right. Since the NES had two buttons, the combo A plus B for the center shot made sense. Seems like it took maybe a couple of tries to get used to it, but then it was quite natural. Another World Circuit in Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. Arkanoid. Loved Arkanoid back in the day. My dad loves Arkanoid. We rented this over and over to the point where my dad just asked the rental place if we could pay just a bit more and keep it. And that included the controller. And they said we could. This mentions a stage select and a continue mode. I remember using continue a few times, but it seems like it only let you continue up until a certain level, although it doesn't mention that here. Some Ring King and Ninja Kid stuff. Zanuck. Zanuck is definitely a fun vertical shooter that was made by Compile, a company of which I'm a huge fan. This page mentions a large score boost of 300,000 bonus points. I'm sure points related tips and Nintendo Power helped contribute to some people's submission of their high scores that would get listed in the NES Achievers section. Points are definitely a carryover from arcade games, of course. Double Dragon. This was a fairly popular game on the NES at the time, but I feel it was eclipsed by other games after its release, especially Double Dragon 2. The NES port was different than the arcade, and the biggest frustration was that it didn't have two player co op. 
Nintendo Power gives a few tips, but these pages mostly serve as a teaser. Gauntlet. Gauntlet was a great four-player game in the arcade. The NES version gives a decent sample of that. Not much here for the game, but that artwork for it is pretty epic. Contra is ultra radical. If this is meant to sell the game to me, I am sold on the artwork alone. The characters in the art are based on images from the movie Predator, and the result is ultra radical. If a friend asked, hey, you want to come over and play Contra, and you didn't own it, you were knocking on their door in just a few seconds. This alien layer screenshot was another great thing to include. Pretty sure I wondered, what is that, the first time I saw this. Ah, game show games have their place, but what a terrible segue. You want another couple of pages of Contra, but you turn the page and get Wheel of Fortune in Jeopardy. This layout is a little too busy, and I'm not sure where my eyes should go. The image of Howard, Nestor, and Annie is kind of fun, though. Video Shorts is a great way to spitball a few games to see if they catch your interest. Not a lot of people talking about Legendary Wings back in the day, and I feel like perhaps it is a little underrated. Iron Tank screenshots might pull you in simply because it has a tank. The soldiers are a little goofy in this game, but I guess that takes away from the violence a bit. Gunsmoke we hit on earlier. Nobody I knew had Rambo, but I found this dialogue screen with the option to say, I feel better in prison, is rather amusing. Dragon Power. Okay, this is rather weird. This is a Dragon Ball game that has been changed and released as Dragon Power for the States. Perhaps Dragon Ball fans living in the States would have been upset about this at the time, except for two things. The Dragon Ball franchise hadn't made its debut yet in the States, and of course there was no internet around to tell you that you need to feel incensed about it. Metal Gear. Imagine a time when nobody stateside knew about Hideo Kojima, the MSX computer, and the giant series this game would evolve into. This description drops hints at stealth with the phrase, sneak into enemy base, and the term espionage, but at a glance I imagine most people said, looks like Akari Warriors. Bionic Commando. The best way to initiate a friend on this game is to hand them the controller and say, you can't jump in this game, good luck. We'll see more of this in the next issue. City Connection was an arcade game that was ported to the NES. It's notable in that the playable character was changed from a girl to a guy for the North American release. Akari Warriors 2 Victory Road. We'll get ourselves on the road to victory. I had a friend back in the day that owned Akari 1 and 2. I always loved playing co-op games and we played both of them. And I'm pretty certain it's safe to say that the second one was better than the first. Star Force, a vertical shooter. Some of the design and colors remind me a little of Astro Warrior for the Sega Master System. I had another friend that had that while I was growing up. Freedom Force, a zapper game from Sunsoft. Nobody I knew had this, and nobody I know talks about it much today. Zapper games seem to finally be making a comeback a bit these days as more people are playing old games on CRTs. Packwatch. Wow, look at these. I actually used to own the arcade cabinet for Terra Cresta around 1999. That was the first time I played it, and I think the NES version is fairly faithful to it. 1943. Loved the arcade version of 1943 since it had co-op gameplay. The NES port was one player only, but still quite a bit better than 1942 on the console. Zelda 2. Here they are basically saying, hang in there, it's going to be released October, we promise. If any of you guys were chomping at the bit for Zelda 2 at this point in time and having trouble finding it in the store, share your story. About the only thing we know so far about this game is its name. Imagine a time where that was all we knew about Blaster Master. Simon's Quest. They mention it is the sequel to Castlevania, and note that it doesn't include Castlevania 2 in the title here. California games saw a ton of ports. The NES version followed a couple of years after the original's release. Xenophobe. I'm glad they managed to keep the arcade split-screen feel and just scale it back to two players to fit the NES. Marble Madness. My friend down the street that introduced me to Nintendo Power had this one, and I remember it being rather difficult to get used to the controls. It's actually a port of an arcade game that used a trackball. 
here's the player's poll where you could fill out this card and send it in to try to win a contest. The first contest is about winning games, so it was pretty basic. We actually see this contest evolve over time. Nest Journal. Look at this. Dragon Quest, the third game in this case, gets a mention in the first issue of Nintendo Power. Anyway, it will be quite interesting to see the reaction of the US market once this is converted to a NES game. Of course, the answer would be not quite as big as it was in Japan. Here's a Vindicators arcade game. Check out the tank treads on that cabinet. Not really going to talk about these books here. They might get their own video. And look at this. Konami's Top Gun video game shootout contest between four finalists and the winner won $5,000. Adjusted for inflation, that is over $10,000 in 2017. Top Gun is an example of a game that isn't really that great, but as far as first-person dogfighting on a NES console, it was maybe all we had at the time. NES Journal. <laughs> I didn't really pay much attention to the movie celebrity section of Nintendo Power back then, but it sure helps frame the era when talking about NES games. Kind of like when you remind someone that the song Stayin' Alive came out the same year as Star Wars. Vibes was a movie with Cyndi Lauper and Jeff Goldblum that was promoted heavily back in the day with these odd commercial spots that involved characters' hands up on glass as they spoke to the camera. It didn't really do that well and faded away quickly. Big Top Pee Wee didn't do great, but I guess if you were a Pee Wee fan, you didn't care. Eight Men Out tells the story of the Chicago White Sox throwing the 1919 World Series. It also didn't do very well at the box office. Perhaps it's more enjoyable if you're a baseball fan and are already vaguely familiar with the story. This also mentions how Bull Durham came out that year, so there's an awful lot of baseball in this issue of Nintendo Power. Kirk and Candace Cameron of Growing Pains and Full House respectively talk about playing Nintendo games here. I think Celebrity Spotlight was a good idea, yet most of the time I think I skipped over it because I wasn't familiar with the celebrities. I knew who Kirk and Candace were though. Looks like their parents enjoyed golf and pinball, and that sounds like games parents would play at the time. Candace rescued the princess in Super Mario Brothers, but hadn't quite mastered Zelda. Kirk mentions some trouble in Gradius and that he may have to call the game counselor soon, and that's certainly a great promotion. Candace says there is a Ness on the set of Full House, which begs the question, is there a Ness on the set of Fuller House? Mailbox. I believe this was eventually moved to the front of Nintendo Power. Howard Phillips has 300 games for the NES. What is the name of the music from Spy Hunter? The answer says, there are already over 100 games available for the NES. So that gives you, once again, some perspective as to where we are in terms of the NES time frame in the summer of 1988. Spy Hunter's theme is, of course, from Peter Gunn. This letter recommends The Legend of Kage. I don't know that this game is favored as much today as it was by this reader at the time. There is a grandmother here that talks about her grandson bringing his nest to her farm after he received one for Christmas, and she logs some time on it. Nintendo Power responds by thanking her for writing and saying they wish they heard from more players in her age group, which is great, and I think we do hear from more of them in future issues. This letter praises Rygar, a home port that, like the yet-to-be-released Ninja Gaiden, deferred from its arcade counterpart. Jason from Oregon waxed on a bit about Metroid, and I could honestly do the same, but I'll spare you for now. Pretty sure I drew this image of Samus on notebook paper at some point back then. Nintendo responds by saying, There are many secrets yet to be discovered, so if you find any new ones, be sure to let us know about them. Whether or not Nintendo Power already knew every single thing there was to know about Metroid, their consistent encouragement for gamers to send in discoveries made about games, such as Metroid, is pretty heartwarming. In the internet era, chances are that anything you find in a game has already been found and posted about by someone else. The pre-internet era lets you feel more of a sense of discovery, and writing to Nintendo Power and having something published in the magazine would most likely put you on cloud nine. It is a feeling that we'll never have again, sadly. Rodolfo praises Double Dribble and goes as far to say, if this game was more realistic, you would be playing in the NBA. He also states, if you have the means, I recommend picking one up which is also a quote that fits the era. Finally, the last letter requests how to obtain the official Nintendo Player's Guide. Nintendo Power responds by giving the price and a phone number. So overall, there is some gushing from fans, which immediately translates into printed word-of-mouth advertisements for certain games here in the mailbox section. 
I usually found it to be a fun section to glance over, and eventually we would start seeing envelope art. Ness Achievers Lots of max scores here and there. A good number of people submitted Excite Byte times. Now that is an outlier on Gradius. 3.7 million versus 1.1 million of second place. That's one of those times when you feel good about your score, submit it, it gets printed in Nintendo Power, but oh wait, someone else beat you decisively. Someone scored 9.999 million on Karate Kid. So that means someone played Karate Kid for a really long time, and it also makes me wonder if it was perhaps the only game they owned. Instructions on how to take a photo of a CRT using a film camera. Another skill set lost with age. Now you could just use your phone or a digital camera and check it as you snap. Of course, with the modern era comes emulators and the ability to fake screenshots. On a more positive note, if you retro game on real hardware today, smartphones sure are handy for recording your password. Video Spotlight. Okay, so in this section, people could ride in and basically brag about their friends or brag about themselves and their accomplishments. This letter mentions a player named Mike and his favorite games Renegade, Double Dribble, and Zybots. Atari's arcade game Zybots, which is spelled with an X, didn't get a final port on the NES. I think there is a prototype out there, but I wonder what Game Jed was referencing here. I actually had an arcade game of Zybots for a little while. This guy beat the original Mega Man in less than four days? Really? One time I went to a friend's house and he had rented Mega Man. Now, remember, there was only one Mega Man game at the time. I remember watching him struggle forever after only defeating Cut Man and Bomb Man. He took a restroom break at one point and I was so tired of watching him struggle, I turned off the Nintendo so we could play something else. When he got out of the restroom, he was angry. This letter also states, Sega doesn't come close to Nintendo, and that makes me wonder if this is the main reason they printed this letter. He also recommends the NES Advantage for The Legend of Zelda, which is very interesting. That controller is not really that great. I don't know if I ever tried Zelda with it, come to think of it. The next guy mentions the Commodore 128, props there for some computer mixing. He also talks about Metroid with the NES Advantage. You know, my buddy that introduced me to Nintendo Power also had a NES Advantage. And so eventually I said, well, I gotta get one. But I ended up buying the wireless Freedom Stick by Comerica back in the day. It cost twice as much as the NES Advantage and was twice as bad. In retrospect, I wish I had picked up the NES Advantage instead, but the wireless one sounded appealing at the time. Not many people in the retro gaming community actually seem to mention or care about the NES Advantage now versus back then. Consider though, the arcade joystick and the Atari joystick were much closer to what people were used to versus the control pad, and I'm sure that figured into it. And of course nowadays it's easy to just build your own controller. Top 30 These days people do top 10 or top whatever lists on YouTube, and the commenters hop in to tell them just how wrong they are. But back then... You saw the top 30 in print, and you either agreed with it, or you were flabbergasted, had your day ruined, and had no way to express your disagreement. In this case, I really approve of the top three games of the top 30, although I actually like Metroid more than Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. Fighting words, I know, but these three games are great, and I'm glad they're here. But if you look a little further down, you'll see Top Gun is at number 9, Castlevania at number 12, and Contra at number 22. Today, that definitely seems like an extremely odd ranking, but note a few things. Knowledge of what games were out there, what games were good, and what games were actually available at retail certainly would have affected this list. Also note the extremely low sample size of points that these games have. I don't know that issue 1 has an accurate top 30 of the time period. In its defense, however, I think it is worth mentioning, again, the internet wasn't around for game exposure, and it is only natural that your sample of gamers in 1988 are going to have different interests at the time than the superset of retro gamers today. Back then, it was an aggregate of three different sample pools, or at least that is how it was explained. The contest card in the issue surveyed the players. I'm not sure how they surveyed the pros and the dealers. Pros have Legend of Zelda and Metroid right at the top, and the dealers have RC Pro-Am. Check out the commentary at the bottom. 
Is it the pro's need for variety that ranks not so popular Wizards and Warriors fifth, while putting popular Top Gun at 27th? Wow. Next issue, Simon's Quest. Again, doesn't mention Castlevania 2 in the title. Howard Phillips' letter mentions traveling to Japan and explaining Wheel of Fortune, and also pushes Zelda 2 again. That stretch of teasing Zelda 2, which predates Nintendo Power, and the actual widespread availability of Zelda 2 at retail stores, seems like five years. Funny thing here on the back cover, this little blurb on the back refers to the upcoming Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom as infamous. So they already knew. And that is issue one. I hope you had a blast with stories, trivia, and more. I hope to continue this series as well. See you next issue.